Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. Alan Peoples here with Patricia Aoi on Lehman. And we're talking about falling into form. What are fallen angels? Fallen angels into form, definitely. Um, and we we have talked a little bit about falling into form before, but um, again, I'm, I'm leading us up to something important. So we're just going to start out with this. So it all begins with the first breath, right? From center, we talked about uh, Bess in the last presentation, and now um, after you know at any at any be, at any ending and moment of silence, we have a new beginning, and that new beginning for us is falling back into form. Um, and so, and this is the expression, you know, we've we've seen you know this slide on the left uh, the left side of the birth of. Um, form as the face of Hathor uh, through the pillars of Boaz and Joachim. We've, we've, we've shown this before, but it's important to where I'm going. You know, this is falling into duality. And if you look at the uh, this beautiful image of Hathor on the right, do you see how the two cobras are coming out on either side, mm -hmm. um, creating, you know, again, that dual opposing wave spin? And her hair is the Milky Way. And her face is the face of form being born um, from um, the center of the circumpolar spin, if you will, in a way, uh, which we'll, we'll, be, we'll go forward with. You know, this, this name of Hector, Hector is, you know, whore. The whore is the seed of life. Um, and this is important to our discussion of the ancient magnetic equator that, you know, we're going to go further in in, in the presentation after this one, we're going to talk about the whore being born, um, and once it's born at that 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 moment of the magnetic equator, it then begins to move. The whore is always in motion, um, the seed of, of uh, consciousness, the seed of um, form itself. So the face of Hattor is the seed being planted in the earth-based perception of reality. Um, and Hattor has so much um, symbolic uh, knowing, knowledge, wisdom within her, her expression from ancient Egypt. And you see that her hair is the omega symbol, which the Greeks made famous. Um, it is the womb, again, the Milky Way that gives birth to, you know, this perception of reality. The Milky Way and the earth uh, are the container for life force itself. Um, and um, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, we have the image of Hathor um, and uh, trying to, they're making this connection between her expression, her hair um, being the uterus as well, that which, you know, gives birth to form, um, the alpha and omega. Here we're looking again at the womb, um, and I'm, I'm making the connection that this womb through which form is born is is literally this ecliptic plane um and this this is a beautiful expression of that birth you know of, of this birth of form with the image of mary inside you know inside the womb again the vesica pisces um uh, and uh, coming out of that moment of of non-motion giving birth to what the alpha the baby jesus She's standing on the egg, and there is the serpent of cycle. She's standing on that, that you know, the, the, in a way, that, that aura of the Ouroboros egg, <laughs> um, which is the center, right? You know, we, we talked about this in the last presentation. And surrounding her are what? The 12 signs of the zodiac, the ecliptic. The, the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. So you have this, you know, here you have it. It's right in front of your eyes. This is the same expression. So this is the beginning of our birth of a perception of reality based on the physical. Um, and it's all electromagnetic, right? Life force. Um, and, and I'm sorry if it's, it feels like I'm repeating myself, but this is so important to understand this. So I think repetition is necessary. You know, the hieroglyphic, for R is this mouth. It's known to be the mouth. It's the opening, the mouth, the gate between the form and the formless realities. Um, and, and here is another, you know, it's a different way of looking at these never setting immortal stars with, you know, our galactic, um, our, actually our north ecliptic pole in the center of Draco. Um, and, uh, you know, here, here is that mouth through which form is born. It, it, those 12 
zodiac signs are circling the north ecliptic pole, right? That's our Santa Claus. Um, and so in the center, I love this image. It's a Masonic image, a painting that's showing, you know, these, these angels descending into form, right? There's our birthing box in the, in the center of this checkerboard pattern of black and white squares. Um, it's the game board of life, right? It's all an illusion between the two pillars. Um, and uh, you see this Foucault's pendulum, right? The physical demonstration of Earth's rotational movement by means of the pendulum. So we, we spin into form, electromagnetism. So in the center here, we have this amazing image. It's a Masonic image or painting, um, and it's showing this birth into this perception of form. You see, it's like the stairway to heaven, but the angels are coming down. Mm -hmm. We are all angels being born into a physical container, this perception of a physical reality. You see that beautiful birthing box in the center. It's always there. And you see the pillars um, on either side. And, you know, the checkerboard is the earth, right? That's the game board of this illusion. Just right? like we see on the ceiling of Dendera. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, and it's such a beautiful image. And then on the lower left hand corner of the painting, you see that the, the, the pendulum, basically, I have an image on the on the far left of Foucault's pendulum, physical demonstration of the Earth's rotational movement by means of the pendulum. Right. We mm -hmm. fall into form as a spin. Right. Electromagnetic energy into this perception of reality. It's all an illusion. This is what we need to drive home and need to understand. The game board is, is basically, it, it's just there. We play the game. And the game, you know, is, is how we, we choose with every choice we make. You know, every, you know, if you're, you're a chess piece on the game board, every move you make is going to determine how you experience reality in the next given moment, right? So it's, it's we are creating our reality as we go through our choices every every mm -hmm. moment is a choice are you gonna you know a choice of attitude a choice of direction you know and and you know we you know our choices you know it, it depends on which wolf are you feeding we talked about the white wolf and the and and the and the, 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 the dark wolf the the, the the um black wolf which wolf will you feed is will right. determine the next moment that you experience um, and even not making a choice is a choice <laughs> exactly uh, yeah stagnation um because life has to flow we chose to be on the game board we chose to be born and so yes stagnation is, is basically in my opinion you know it's not it's not a viable choice um it's uh, you know well they, they say in screenwriting stasis equals death <laughs> there you have it there you, you have, have it. you it's have great. to keep the story moving I remember doing a picture once. I was drawing a picture once. I was in some sort of workshop and I drew this picture of, you know, this stagnant pond, you know, with it doesn't have flowing water going through it. You know, if you have on one side, I had this beautiful pool of water with water flowing into it and butterflies and fish jumping. And it was just alive with, you know, with, with, activity and then the stagnant puddle which was growing algae and ugh, it was awful um so yes um change is is the constant and it's you know how we how we walk through it um determines um everything <laughs> um, and if we took more responsibility for our choices i think our life would change drastically um but all that aside, let's get back into falling into form. We've talked about Pata um, being, you know, the birth into this uh, uh, perception of form from out of the blue, primordial waters, and he holds this this um, this triple uh, staff, which has the wasp scepter going into the jed pillar, right into the spine and through the womb of the ox symbol. And that is falling into form, right? And the waset has the face of set on it, right? So it is set being that being of pure light, that angel falling into form through the womb and into the jet. He is, he is chaos 
well, he becomes chaotic because how would you feel if you're pure, beautiful, white spirit, freedom, and you're stuck in a body that you can't get out of, right? You become chaotic. And that is why set is explained this way. You know, it's, it's beautiful white light, you know, bright light spirit being locked in form. Um, and as we keep saying, the perception that we are, our bodies is what holds us hostage um, in uh, the sphere-based reality. Uh, Joseph Campbell said, God suppressed become devils. And often it is these devils whom we first encounter when we turn inward, um, which is interesting. So, you know, again, we talked about the Tibetan Book of the, the Dead takes you through that path of meeting your own beasts. You know, we have them within us because we want freedom, right? Here we have Pata. We, we've talked about Pata before as this expression of, you know, the, the process of falling into form, right, from out of the blue primordial waters. Um, and uh, he's said to be the one who comes from the blue through the waters from the stars, right? And he wears the primordial waters, the womb of primordial waters as his cap. Um, and you can see that he, you know, he's wrapped in his own wings, right? You fall into form, you lose your ability, your freedom, right? Um, and that is the physical expression. And, you know, in the center, I show he's holding this, this uh, triple staff that has a, wa a, a wasp scepter, right? Mm -hmm. Falling in through the womb of the Ankh into a jed pillar, the spine, right? The axis. And, and I view this, this is set, right? Waset, waset. It's, he's falling into form. Um, you know, this beautiful being of light, um, you know, later called Lucifer, if you will, right? This light being, this beautiful being of light, this angel falls into form, right? Held hostage by a belief that he is his body, right? So you take this being that was once free and it's enclosed in a body. And of course, he, you know, he represents chaos because, you know, he's just trying to get out of that physical container. Um, and that's why, you know, this is why we have this idea that said is evil. That again is twisted through the ages. It's really that feeling of needing to get, you know, needing escape. And that's mm -hmm. what we all have. We all have this deep need for, you know, to have freedom of expression, freedom to express ourselves, uh, freedom of movement, uh, security. We lose all these things. As I've said before, we, we you know, we're held hostage by a belief that we're our, we are our bodies um, and then can be manipulated and controlled through fear. Um, and Joseph Campbell says it best, God's, God's suppressed. We were the gods, you know, that fell into form. We were the angels of light, the angles of light falling into form. Um, God suppressed become devils. And often it's these devils whom we first encounter when we turn inward. Um, and if you remember, we talked about uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead mm. and how, you know, they talk about, you know, that this this dead, this this entity that leaves its body first encounters these um, these monsters. Right? right. These monsters are, you know, th these are the, the, the monsters that develop within us as a part of that physical, the duality of a physical reality. Um, and it's realizing and accepting this duality that allows us to move forward and to change the dynamics of our patterns. Mm -hmm. Transmuting um, that energy. It's almost like passing through a gate in the book of, in the uh, book of hours, right? Exactly. It's exactly, it's the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I said before, I think they read the Tibetan book of the dead to the living because we are the ones grieving. There is no death, right? The other person has crossed over into its next beginning, its next expression. Um, and it's, it's us that need the lesson, <laughs> you know, you know, face our demons, you know, if we immediately, you know, so much dogma has told us to, to hate the devil inside, right? You know, if you sin, you're going to go to hell. Well, there is no hell. It's a hell we create for ourselves on earth. Face our demons, transmute them, mm. you know, which wolf are you going to feed? Hell is really being out of balance, out of mob. Exactly. Exactly. I look at hell and heaven. Heaven has even in it, even and odd. You know, L is electricity. Heaven is magnetism. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways. You know, our words are, are, are not, you know, our labels are containers of expressions themselves. Um, and the tones within them have meaning. 
um, which you know goes all the way back to the ancient hieroglyphics. It's it's just amazing. So yeah, here's just more images of this. This, you know, there's a beautiful image of Ptah. You can see that he has these three um, scepters. And the wasp scepter never hits the ground. Um, it, it's supposed to never be presented hitting the ground because uh, it's contained in form, um, locked in, in body. And, you know, I, I think I've mentioned this before early on in the presentations. It's the sword in the stone, yeah, right? I love this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Um, that, you know, that's our jed, that's our spine, right? Um, and I love that, you know, and this, this, this uh, um, expression here in the center, they're showing the, the phases of the moon on the back of the uh, skull. So much wonderful symbolism here. So in the center we have from Manly P. Hall, he says, the most sacred part of the human body is the brain and spinal system, revered from all antiquity and symbolized again and again in all all the religions of the world. While other parts of the body are of great interest to the student, the mysterious working of the spinal flyers by means of which liberation is finally attained is so tremendous that many years must be spent in understanding even the fundamental principles. The spine is the rod which budded the, um, how do you say that, Yggdrasil tree? The flaming sword, the staff of comfort, the wand of the magi, right? Um, it's it's basically the sword and the stone, as I said. Um, and here is this wonderful image of Author, Author, Horus, if you will, pulling that beautiful sword out of the stone. It's the spirit. It's the release. Um, and you know, it's it's only the innocence of youth, right, that can transmute polarity and um, find the freedom, free at last, the ascension from this belief in form. Um, and uh, I relate this also, of course, to the leg of the bull, which is set, right? Um, that's spinning around contained in the circumpolar stars, looking for a release from this spinning, right? Spinning in circles. <laughs> want to stop spinning. I want that silent space. I want to get back to my heart. Um, so yeah. And this is fascinating too. This is imagery um, found here in Egypt. Uh, you see the wasp scepters um, on the on the left side. You see just a two, like sort of just a, a flat image of the two wasp scepters facing each other, holding up nude, the heavens. Right? Mm -hmm. It's containment. And in the the one on the right, you see actually dimensionality with the four. Um, and it says at the bottom, wasp scepter shown standing on the hieroglyph denoting Earth. Ta, and ta. holding up the sky, pet, um, from the symbol, uh, I say newt, but, you know, pet is another word for newt. You, you, you could actually see her, her arms right. and her legs coming down. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> holding up the sky from Symbol and Magic in Egyptian Art by Richard H. Wilkinson. Uh, the two-dimensional depiction is understood to represent three dimensions, thus two wasp scepters represent four. Um, and it's containment. It's, it's literally showing you containment. That's what the wasp scepter represents. I think not so much dominion, but containment. And this is really fascinating. Not everybody knows about Vivian, um, but there is a um, there is a, the legends of, of Merlin and Vivian from Arthurian legend. Uh, it's uh, they're locked in an eternal romance wherein Merlin is ultimately enclosed by Vivian within a tree. Um, and what does that sound like, Alan? That <laughs> sounds like uh, Isis and Osiris. Exactly. Um, the, the same, that same uh, mythology about uh, Set imprisoning um, Osiris in, in, he has a coffin made, you know, especially to fit his size, size, a beautifully crafted coffin made of wood, right, of acacia wood or cedar mm -hmm. wood. And uh, he shows Osiris and says, oh, look, isn't it beautiful? And Osiris loves it and hops in and then he slams on the lid. <laughs> the oldest trick in the book. <laughs> the oldest trick in the book, right? <laughs> uh, so again, uh, th it's always this tale of this containment, you know, you know, and then release from containment. And on this uh, picture on the right, on the left, it says, you know, she's Vivian waving her hands and muttering the charm and presently enclosed him fast within the tree. So, yeah. 
what are you going to do? So Set and Merlin become the currency embodied by Earth. And Walter Russell says, God is within everything. God is one force of which everything in the universe is an inseparable but not separable part. So, of course, Set is not evil. You know, again, as Hakim had said, it all depends on, you know, which way you're looking, what direction you're looking. Is he in or out of the container? If you go back um, just one slide, if we're looking at the, uh, the etymology of Merlin, of course, we have mer, line, like. Yep. <laughs> but what about yep. Vivian? To me, that looks like, I don't know the etymology of the name Vivian, but is it related to life? As in. Well, it is, but, but yeah, vibrant. Uh, but V is always a feminine. Um, as we talked about before, we have, you know, the V of Vega. We have the V of um, that's within love. We have V vagina. We have uh uh, v is always Venus, uh, you know, it's always related to the divine feminine. So yeah, definitely. Well, it's also the Holy Grail. It's the, the letter V or the U is a chalice itself. There you go. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, it's the womb. It's shaped, you know, it's a receiving energy. So absolutely. Um, and of course, the pillar is the opposite. <laughs> The seeding energy. Um, uh, and here we have creation occurs from the erect lotus pillar as an ecliptic pole spinning into form. I've shown this picture before at Kalash Temple. It's at the top of the temple. Uh, this basalt, huge, huge uh, structure carved out of one big solid piece of basalt. Um, but this is what fascinates me. And you see the birthing box in the center and they're spinning into form and it's four lions. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it, it's it's just this, it's everywhere. The Waj, this is this is what ha we see um, Horus sitting on the papyrus pillar, right? And with the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. In that moment of silence um, uh, before the next breath. But the Waj or papyrus thought it's a hieroglyph. It mean, you know, it meant green or fresh. Green related to earth, which is interesting. The papyrus was closely associated again with rebirth and regeneration. Um, the pillar. I've shown this before again, um, and it's I, again. There's Bess and and uh, Bess as that moment of silence when the two currents come together. Hathor as that moment of the next birth. When the two currents separate, you see uh, the two cobras, one with the red crown and one with the white crown, separating at that line of demarcation, the ancient magnetic equator. Um, we've seen this imagery again. I, I drive my points home. <laughs> um, the opening of the mouth activates the, the life force. So you open the circumpolar, um, you know, that mouth where, you know, it's actually set inside. <laughs> um, opening the mouth activates that ability to fall into form. Right, and of course, the, the opening of the mouth tool is the shape of the Big Dipper itself. It's, well, exactly, exactly. Uh, it's, it's just amazing how they weave all this knowing together and all their imagery. And unfortunately, we, you know, most, most of us look at it all separately. You know, we go in and we look, oh, that means that and that means that. And what I'm trying to hear is connect to do here is connect all those dots to give you a total overall image that, you know, this is actually all speaking to this this amazing dynamic um, or pattern of life itself. Every every piece fits. Um, right. It's not, again, it's not I, coincidental. Not even, not in the least. Uh, so again, I'm showing you an image in 3D where you can see the ecliptic pole, everything you know spinning, <laughs> and this is this is what creates our perception of form. What an amazing uh, game board! And there we yeah. are again, spinning. Back to Seti the first. So here we have this wonderful presentation that shows us how we can use the Big Dipper, right? Which is uh, set, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can use it to tell time, you know, what time is it if we look in the heavens? Um, and they actually used, um, they, you know, the ancients basically all over the world used the Big Dipper as a, a device for measuring time and space. Um, so yeah, 
the spin of the D Big Dipper, and you can see we, we've shown you the swastika sign that can be created by the relationship between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper uh, spinning in the circumpolar stars. Um, and as I said, it can be used as a 24-hour clock and as an indicator of where the pool star is located. Um, and from uh, Vedic or from this Vedic astrologer, Septa Rishi are the seven greatest sages of the Vedic realm. They have attained a semi-immortal status, that of exceedingly long lifespan due to their yogic power and by the power of their penance. The seven holy sages were assigned to be present through the four great ages to guide the human race. This is, this is important. The seven sages or Saptarishis worked closely with Lord Shiva to maintain the balance on earth. Mm -hmm. So basically it it's saying what I've been saying. It's, you know, when I say, where is Horace? What time is it? It is what state of consciousness are we in? You know, where is the, where is the big dipper? You know, what's happening? What, you know, what's happening along this path of our Ouroboros, the mouth of the circumpolar stars? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and 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 I, I just love this, and I'm just putting it out there, folks. But I find this fascinating. Um, you know, the age of Cancer is when we begin marking time and space again after the floodwaters recede. And I, you know, I I said this when we showed you the the the, the uh, Dendera zodiac. It, you know, it starts in the age of Cancer. It starts in Cancer also because um, Cancer, July, at this moment was when they had, you know, the great floods, uh, the, the annual flood of the Nile happened. It was their new year. It was, you know, an important month annually, but also it was, a per, you know, incredibly important month. Um, uh, as we, we mentioned in the last presentation of the birth of form in the age of cancer. And this is when we begin to need calendars again for marking time and space after the moment of silence, right? Nothing's moving. And suddenly we're moving again. We build stone circles. You know, we, we've discussed this. But what's interesting, if you look at this diagram and we can see Draco, there's your ecliptic pole. And then we see all these wonderful pole stars surrounding, you know, the ecliptic pole. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm, I'm asking, you know, about, you know, where is Atlantis? And according to Plato, you know, he says that Atlantis lay beyond the pillars of Hercules. And if we're looking at this mapping, this calendar, if you will, that's marking time and space, <laughs> if we look at where... Um, Hercules is in the heavens, the constellation, mm -hmm. you know, you can see his two, you know, the two arms coming up, which I show you with the blue arrow. And they literally are, are marking the time between 10,000 and 8,000 BC, meaning beyond the pillars would have been right around Vega, right? <laughs> right? This is so important. <laughs> this is when Atlantic Atlantis existed for everyone in a perception of time and space, right? This is that great moment um, of <laughs> of um, our highest level of consciousness. Well, and interesting, it's pointing to Vega, which is another V, which is the matriarchal spin, right? Which is, yeah, exactly what we were just saying. So, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, and maybe this is where the enigmatic Atlantis exists. It's not, we're not looking for it on earth. It's a place in the heavens, right? It's, it's a, a place marking in time and space, you know, and, uh, on the hero's journey, if you will. You know, our highest state of consciousness happens when, you know, at, at the first breath out of Gnosis. Um, and uh, I believe that's what it's telling us. And I believe, you know, it's a moment, you know, for, for everyone, for animals, for plants, and in humanity, in this expression of form, we are all in unity, consciousness in that moment, and we feel each other, and we build megalithic uh, uh, structures, and we create these symbolism, and that, that has the knowing of the patterns to tell us what what's going to happen as we devolve into this lower state of consciousness. And of course, on the other side, you know, the, the directly opposing side is Polaris. That's why I say we're at end game. That's the end of the game, the game board. It, it's over, you know, and uh, Polaris is complete polarity. And, uh, you know, it says right there, 2000 AD. Uh, so <laughs> we're there. We still, see, you know, Polaris is our pole star, but we are, we are precessing out of that into the age of Aquarius where all bets are off. 
So, yeah. Okay, I've got a cat in front of me. I can't see. <laughs> Hello, Jasper. Um, so here I have, I, I want to talk about, you know, we talk about consciousness shifting um, with uh, the movement of the stars. And so, uh, you know, I, I've said this before, conscious perception shifts with subtle changes in our relativity to solar, stellar, and lunar events. And to, just to give you an example, we, you know, so many of us are familiar with what happens during Mercury retrograde, you know, and, and you know, it's some, semi well known that, you know, this is a time when we have miscommunication and arguments, difficulty expressing ourselves, mm -hmm. overly emotional and sensitive to criticism. We become overly critical of ourselves and others, traffic delays, minor accidents, revisiting old traumas, anxious, nervous, and clumsy. <laughs> Frustrated and struggling to complete tasks, mental health and mental clarity issues, rekindle toxic relationships that should be left in the past. Um, they always say you don't sign documents during a Mercury retrograde, you know, and, and don't plan big trips or don't make big plans for anything um, because it's that, that, you know, it's an energy that's happening right in the stars that is affecting our consciousness. Um, some of what I just described happens during, you know, full moon. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, people go crazy. There's more crime. There's, you know, it's, it's moments of agitation. I have trouble sleeping during a full moon. Um, so, yeah, full moon lunatics. You know, even our language, you know, the, these labels contain this knowledge that the movement of in the movement in the heavens affects how what's happening with us on earth our state of consciousness um, and um, what i'm trying to present here is the movement um in the circumpolar stars on this much wider scale is affecting um in a huge way how we perceive reality mm -hmm. moving from a left brain to right brain and back again consciousness with moments of where we have complete oneness you know, where we're harnessing both uh, sides of our, both hemispheres of the brain. And this is what I'm talking about with the ancient magnetic equator. It's both hemispheres of the earth coming together in a moment of oneness electromagnetically, and then the separation occurs. Um, it's a journey of, of consciousness. You know, there you have it. It's a journey of consciousness. Um, from Rory Duff, uh, I've spoken about him before, going further out into the cosmos still, we can include the great galactic cycles with even bigger regular effects on human consciousness. It is with this that we can now begin to see how roughly every 12,000 years, we find human consciousness changing from individual consciousness to group consciousness, separation consciousness and unity consciousness, and back again. Yeah. Just as Rudolf Steiner had so brilliantly managed to find out. Um, and as I'm trying to point out, the ancients of Egypt so clearly saw this as well, and, and in other ancient cultures all over the world. This was an ancient knowing that somehow got lost through the ages. Um, and that knowing, you know, as I try and keep saying, we don't have to remain in this state and wait for the stars to move. If we're if we know the patterns we can change our reality in any given moment. And this is beautiful. This was posted on social media by Graham Hancock. Um, and it's about Stanislav Grof. Um, he is a psychiatrist with over 60 years of experience in research of non-ordinary states of consciousness. And he says, I now firmly believe that consciousness is more than an accidental byproduct of the neurophysiological and biochemical processes taking place in the human brain. I see consciousness and the human psyche as expressions and reflections of a cosmic intelligence that permeates the entire universe and of all existence. We are not just highly evolved animals with biological computers embedded inside our skulls. We are also fields of consciousness without limits, transcending time, space, matter, and linear consciousness. Mm. Um, the the only cute. limits are what we put on ourselves. Hallelujah. You bet. Mm. Um, and it's easy to, to read it on paper and say, yeah, right. Um, but to live that knowing, to, to, to learn to stop limiting ourselves, that's, that's you know, there are moments in my life where I wasn't, 
you know, brought back into 3D with, with things, right? Things happening that, you know, the magic just happened constantly, spontaneously, because I, I moved without fear. I, I had this beautiful heart, heart, heartfelt belief that I was living a magical, you know, moment. Um, and, and so it was happening and, and, and incredible things were happening and it still happens today. I'm not saying it's lost, um, but, but continuing, you know, you, you have those moments and you want to maintain them. And it's so difficult when you're, you're traveling the sine wave, you know, the serpent pattern of life. Um, but the, the more you understand it, the more magic you make, you know, and that is what Hekka is. It's magic. It's mastering the currents. It's um, interesting. His uh, book was called "The Holographic Mind." Yes. Because if you, um, if you think of the nature of a hologram, if you cut a hologram in two, you have two holograms. Every fractal. part of the hologram contains the whole. It's fractal. It's fractal, which is again what we've been trying to show. Everything is fractal. It's cycles within cycles. Every every minute is the same pattern as every hour, as every day, as every year, as every great year. It's always the same. You know, I didn't just make up that, oh, we must have four seasons in a great year. Um, it's, it is, it has to be, because that's the pattern. Um, and once you understand and know it, then, then you can start to navigate the patterns. And as you say, it can't be any other way, because this is the pattern that we are based on. We can't escape the pattern. <laughs> you can't escape it. It's within us. And so when we believe all the nonsense that's, you know, that, that all the programming, if you will, um, then we become that, you know, that's, that's what we create. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I like to say just, you know, wipe the slate clean, you know, let's eliminate all those core beliefs and like children begin again um, and build our, 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 our belief system, our perception of reality from experience. Um, it, it would be a whole different journey, I think. Um, but here, I just love this because, you know, I saw this for the first time when I was watching a program on the History Channel. It wasn't Ancient Aliens. It was another program, uh, researchers out. Um, and they were actually, they went to Alaska to look at the, uh, the, the magnetic anomalies that were happening. And so this, this gentleman with, uh, who had this machine that created vortexes, right? Vortex energy, mm -hmm. uh, which they can do. He put this vortex uh, machine in between these two of the researchers. One was a woman, she was very small and petite, and one was a very big man. And even viewing it on the TV, you know, from them filming it, and, and they were saying even the cameraman was in awe. But when he, on either side of this portal, she became bigger and he got smaller. And it was wild, and, and it really shows you how our perception of time and space is 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 not stagnant. In other words, you know, it changes, it more it morphs and, and changes dependent on electromagnetism. You know how huge that is. You know, it, it's just incredible. So this is actually at a Montana vortex, and I saw this again online, and I thought, what a great way to present this concept of this vortex. And that vortex energy is also what Dr. Ibrahim Karim of biogeometry speaks about, you know, is this like BG3 energy, this, the, the, you know, the, why they build these temples around these vortex energies, at these sites all over the world, because they're harnessing this energy that allows us to move beyond time and space, right? Um, just so important. It reminded me when I was growing up, nearby we had a place called the the mystery spot you know there were bumper stickers on everybody's car and an anomalous area where a ball would actually roll uphill yes yes there are places in in california and there's a place here i had a driver actually uh, show me there is a place here in cairo where the car if you if you stop it'll actually start to go back uphill again these places um, are all over the world they are all yep Yep, vortex energy. Um, and here you can see it maybe a little better uh, when they switch places. And you see in the center where the same gentleman is back to back with all the variables being the same. And when mm -hmm. he just moves to the other side of the portal, he becomes smaller or bigger. <laughs> um, just crazy. 
so yeah, by Dan Shaw, he wrote this book, How Vortexes Affect Us, Electromagnetism and Beyond. And uh, the description is a richly illustrated walk through all the different ways that vortexes affect us with relatively few words. How many different components contribute to the total electromagnetic field? How many just in soil? Fracto emission and oceanic charging are just two of the dozens of electric phenomenon on Earth, in the ocean, and in space that affect our bodies at a cellular level with the potential to affect our physiology and also our consciousness and emotions. Um, so yeah, depending on where we're at, our, our consciousness can change here on Earth. And it's all about electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is an incredibly, uh, you know, this is like the, 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 this is the this is the place that you know people just don't go today to to really understand these electromagnetic currents and how they affect our uh, experience of life, right? Um, yeah, how we experience reality is not at all no. how humans always experience reality throughout time. No, and, and trying to explain, you know, a mythology from, you know, 3,000 years ago with our current understanding, it's no, it's no wonder we fail because we think completely differently. How can we understand their tools? How can we understand their technologies? Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I don't think they use machines to build these megalithic structures. I think they harness the powers of nature, you know, the netters. Uh, they, they knew, they felt the energies. Like I said, they spoke, they could, they could speak to the animals, you know, not, not orally, obviously, mm -hmm. but they connected on, on other levels. Um, and um, the indigenous know this, and, and some of the indigenous today can do this today. I mean, I've admitted, I've spoken, I've heard, I've talked with trees um, and, and rocks. And yet people would say, Patricia, you're, you're totally crazy. And <laughs> I can't, you know, if you let go of your ego, of yourself, and you just connect with nature, it's amazing how it will speak to you. Um, it's amazing to think of rocks as having consciousness. You wouldn't believe it, but it was, it, it's why I had, yeah, I, I, I can admit it. When I used to go on these long hikes, when I lived in Albuquerque, I had a, I had a home at the, the, in the foothills. So I, I had a view of all of Albuquerque below. And there were these great hiking trails behind, uh, you know, in, in the mountains, just at the base of the mountains. And I used to go like, several times a week for hours. And I'd always go past these, these couple of rocks. And I swear they would start to talk to me. <laughs> um, and it was wild. And I've had many experiences with trees that were confirmed. You know, the knowledge they gave me was, was confirmed. So um, it sounds wild. It sounds bizarre. You know, Susan, our, our, our geologist, um, and she's spoken pub publicly about this, but she, the rocks speak to her. Um, and, uh, you know, why wouldn't they? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's just hard. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not that you're talking to a rock, it's that you're connecting to a frequency. It, well, they've said everything moving is alive. Every, every organic thing is alive. You know, just because a rock doesn't move in front of your eyes doesn't mean it's not moving. Well, it is you moving know? just exactly. very, very slowly. It takes millions and millions or billions of years for it to... <laughs> exactly, it's just like crystals. Crystals are growing. But yeah, not right before your eyes. You're you're in a different you know state of of growth. Everything grows in different ways. Um, so ascension for sure. Um, it's just you know we we are so programmed to think in a linear fashion um, and put everything into containers and and you know wrap little bows around it and say that a thing is a thing is a thing and maybe it's not. Just like you know. I'm not just Patricia. I am existing on so many different levels and so many different um, uh, uh, fields of, of perception. Uh, and this is just my focal point now is being in this container, which is labeled Patricia. Hmm. But I went out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if you think about it, you are out for a third of your life when you're asleep. You're free. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and we could talk about that for hours. 
Um, so here again, it's showing you how they uh, determined how they how how you can easily determine the pole star from by using uh, the stars of the Big Dipper. Um, that the the two stars at the the very you know one side of the the the, the Dipper <laughs> point directly to the North Star, um, and this obviously was an ancient knowing as well. And I have the seven Hattors here because. You know, a lot of people say they're the seven stars of the Pleiades, and they are, but they're also the seven stars, the seven watchers of the Big Dipper. And I also believe they're the seven, they represent the seven pole stars. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have reason to believe that. I have this image again of Sachet um, and the stretching of the cord ceremony. This image on the left is from um, a wonderful chapel of uh, Hatshepsut at uh, the Open Air Museum in uh, Ikarnak. It's, it's really beautiful. This chapel is amazing, the Red Chapel, they call it. Um, but she's doing the stretching of the cord ceremony with, um, uh, with Sachet. So this is an image of, of Hatshepsut, basically. Uh, they show her as a man, of course. As a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm also showing you how they were doing this with the ancient tools. It's called the Marquette there. Uh, that uh, in the image in the center at the top is is a Marquette. And notice it has an image of uh, Sokar on it, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which is fascinating. But this is how they utilize this to actually determine um, where the pole stars are. And this was important, too, because they say uh, in the temple at Edfu and, and in some of the other temples that sh they're actually aligning these temples. They're all aligned utilizing this Big Dipper uh, in some way or another. Um, and uh, again, the pole stars uh, are are the are the really most important stars because they're telling us what state of consciousness we're in in any given moment. Um, the masters of eternity, if you will, seven watchers, seven sages, seven Hathors, uh, even the seven stars on uh, the, the the seven petals or the seven <coughs> points on the star of Sachet's crown. Um, and here you see the seven culbras on uh, Hathor's crown. And we know the seven is important because that seven, you know, everything comes from the one that becomes three or becomes two, becomes three, and, and then morphs into the seven, which, you know, becomes our pattern of reality, seven seas, seven, seven continents, seven landmass, seven primary colors, seven, mm -hmm. you know, Days of the week, seven Classic planets. Yeah, it's it's literally, you know, and the seven highest qualities of energy that form our perception of reality. So incredibly important. Um, uh, this image was was posted on the far left, uh, was posted by Trevor Grassi. I just met him, uh, took him to Saqqara a couple weeks ago, and I saw this image and it's really beautiful. And uh, I noticed that uh, Laird Scranton commented on it when he posted it. Uh, it uh, about it on social media. And I thought it was interesting that, you know, Laird uh, shared this um, Egyptian uh, description of what it means and he relates it to the Sa. And it's funny when well, you see the two eyes in the body of Orion and there's seven stars underneath, right? And they're called the seven stages of conscious awareness and containment, right? This is, this is you know, it's, it's you, it, you can't escape this, patterning. Um, and as Laird says, the glyph is a name for Egypt's counterpart to Kabbalism's notion of non-deified primordial, primordial individual. You know, the two eyes come together and separate. And Orion is, Orion is Sa, right? But he is also Osiris on this journey, the hero's journey. Um, and what are the seven, but the seven uh, chakras, as you said, the seven uh, inner suns of our perception um, that hopefully our kundalini rises through. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. In the upcoming presentations, we're going to get deeper into the, the, um, the understanding of the arc and the ancient magnetic equator and the, um, the energy of the movement of the whore, which is the seed of consciousness. So, it's going to get really more and more interesting as we go forward. And then we're going to get into the, gold, the, 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 the key that opens the golden gate, the portal, the Aquarius, um, 
the Aquarius Leo portal, which is what we're moving into in this very moment in time, or how we perceive time. So stay tuned. We have a lot more coming. <laughs> Our website is horusrising.com. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you, Alan.